in this short video, um, we're going to talk about maintenance of consciousness. What are the neural mechanisms that keep us awake? Um, and if we understand the neural mechanisms of, of wakefulness, um, we can then understand what can happen to cause us to become drowsy, go to sleep, lose consciousness. Um, and the first thing I want to point out to you is that consciousness depends upon the integrity of two important structures and the connections between them. So first of all, in order to be conscious, we need a functioning um, cerebral cortex. And in addition to this, we need a functioning reticular formation. Okay, We need these two structures to be working in order to remain conscious. And what we have are reciprocal connections between the cortex and the reciprocal and the uh, reticular formation. And these reciprocal connections are themselves excitatory. Okay, so the cortex is able to excite the reticular formation, and the reticular formation is able to excite the cortex. And so what we have here is a positive feedback loop where during wakefulness the cortex stimulates the reticular formation and the reticular formation stimulates the cortex. And this is very typical um, whenever we have um, two discrete states, for example awake and asleep, these are regulated by positive feedback loops. So to maintain wakefulness we have this positive feedback loop running constantly whilst we're awake and if we want to go to sleep we have to break the cycle, inhibit it somehow, so that it stops turning around quite so fast. So that's the basic idea about maintaining consciousness, a positive feedback loop between the cortex and the reticular formation. Now, cortical lesions can cause loss of consciousness, as can brainstem lesions, which can affect the reticular formation. So if you lose one of these components, um, you will lose consciousness. Likewise, if you interrupt the connections between them, this will also disrupt your conscious level. Uh, and we see this in uh, diffuse axonal injury and uh, other serious head injuries. Now let's look at this in a bit more detail. So we're going to draw just a, a lateral view through the um, whole central nervous system. So here is the, the brain with its temporal lobe, the brain stem and the spinal cord. And there's the cerebellum there okay um, so let's draw on the reticular formation which we know is a, a diffuse structure which exists within the brainstem there all right um, and if the reticular formation wants to talk to the uh, cerebral cortex up here like any other structure it has to go via the thalamus okay so there is the thalamus Let's draw on two additional structures important in maintenance of consciousness. Uh, the hypothalamus here and another group of structures called the basal forebrain nuclei. Okay, so we'll just label these. These are the basal forebrain nuclei. Okay. So to recap, we've got Reticular formation in the brainstem, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the basal forebrain nuclei. These, along with the cerebral cortex, are the important structures for maintenance of consciousness. Now, let's draw on one of the inputs that we've already defined to the reticular formation. Um, and this is the descending um, stimulation coming from the cerebral cortex. So the cortex itself sends um, excitatory projections down into the reticular formation. Which other inputs are there to the reticular formation? Well, as we all know, um, one thing that keeps us awake is constant sensory stimulation. And if we take away sensory stimulation, um, this is when we start to go to sleep. So let's add on sensory stimulation. So here is um, a sensory neuron, there's its cell body, um, and it's a sense through the cord, of course, and synapses in the reticular formation. Of course, this neuron also projects to other regions, uh, like the gray cell and cuneate nuclei, for example, and the thalamus itself. But we're just focusing on maintenance of consciousness. So what we've shown here are the inputs to the reticular formation. 
Next what we'll do is we'll show how the reticular formation talks back to the cortex and it has to go through the thalamus. So these outputs of the uh, reticular formation we're going to um, use blue to represent those. So here is um, a blue neuron coming from the reticular formation up to the thalamus and then from the thalamus back up to the cortex. So what we've drawn on here is the positive feedback loop that we just drew in the simple diagram on the left hand side but we've just added the thalamus into the picture. So there's our positive feedback loop going from cortex to reticular formation and back up to cortex via the thalamus. Okay. Now the um, projections that we are drawing here are all excitatory. Uh, and that fits with the schema that we drew on the left. We said it was a positive feedback loop involving reciprocal excitation of the cortex and reticular formation. So all of these projections are excitatory. Um, and actually, all the projections coming from the reticular formation to these subcortical structures use acetylcholine as their transmitter. Okay? So the reticular formation activates the thalamus using acetylcholine. It also sends projections to the hypothalamus, okay, and it uses acetylcholine there to stimulate the hypothalamus, and then the hypothalamus itself sends projections up to the cortex, which are excitatory. And finally, the reticular formation sends excitatory cholinergic projections to the basal forebrain nuclei which itself projects back up to the cortex. So we've got a very very clear and powerful positive feedback loop occurring here and as we said all of these synapses here in these nuclei are cholinergic. Acetylcholine is a very important neurotransmitter in the maintenance of consciousness. Additionally, the basal forebrain nuclei is a cholinergic nucleus and it activates the cortex using acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is important in the uh, projections from the basal forebrain nuclei up to the cortex and these are excitatory, as they all are. Okay, So we'll just show this here. Acetylcholine acting as an excitatory transmitter in the basal forebrain nuclei and also in the cortex. The hypothalamus actually sends histaminergic projections up to the cortex. So histamine is the um, transmitter there, and these are excitatory. And the thalamus sends glutamatergic inputs up to the cortex. And as you know, glutamate is also excitatory. So what we've got is a whole load of excitatory neurotransmitters being released in the cortex to maintain wakefulness. Okay. Now, what we've drawn here is actually really clinically quite important. For example, certain antihistamines are known to induce drowsiness. And this is because if you antagonise histamine at the level of the cortex you take away one of these excitatory inputs coming up from the hypothalamus. Therefore, you make this positive feedback loop turn around a bit more slowly and you get a bit drowsy, a bit less wakeful. Likewise, we know that some cholinergic agents have um, drowsiness as a side effect, and that's the same reason. Okay, So that's all I'm going to talk about when it comes to the maintenance of consciousness.